Okay. Continuing on with our outstanding guest speaker series, today the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab is proud to welcome back Jonathan Dickey. Jonathan is a 53rd generation descendant of, I hope I'm pronouncing this correct, Childrick, the first king of the Franks who ruled from 458 to 481. Our speaker is a member of the order of the, okay, I'm gonna probably mispronounce this, Mergovigian dynasty, am I, am I pronouncing that right? Merovingian. Thank Susan. you. <laughs> the Order of the Crown of Charlemagne, the Order of Norman Conquest, the Baronial Order of Magna Carta, and a number of other lineage societies honoring our European royal and noble ancestors. In addition, Jonathan belongs to a number of societies honoring our American ancestors. He currently serves as the Chief Historian for the Northern California Company of the Jamestown Society, Counselor of the Nevada Mayflower Society, and Counselor of the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. He proudly serves as a member of the Color Guard of the Battleborn Patriots chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution. And he has given a number of genealogy talks in the past few years, most recently in December of 2020, where he spoke to the GR Genealogy Lab about the Jamestown story, Tracing Your Virginia Ancestors. In today's presentation, he's going to cover the broad topic of tracing your medieval ancestors, which covers a period of over 800 years. He will explain that while this sounds daunting, the basic research te techniques for tracing your medieval ancestors are well understood by trained genealogists, and you can understand them too. He will provide an overview of the key societies that most individuals tend to focus on and the application processes involved. He will also discuss the genealogy books and other resources that are considered to be the most authoritative in this area, and also some of the shortcuts you can take advantage of. So without further ado, I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Jonathan Dickey. All right, well, thank you, uh, Suzanne, for that warm introduction. It's good to be back. And thanks uh, to all of you for uh, listening in. Uh, I'm gonna apologize in advance. Uh, I read a story the other day about the most annoying things about Zoom meetings. And one is when you're sitting as I am with windows nearby, you have leaf blowers and uh, all kinds of things going on outside. Well, with this wind today, I've got some wind chimes that may uh, intrude on uh, the sound quality of this uh, presentation, so, so bear with me. Uh, I also wanna mention, Suzanne, I hope you can do this. Uh, if you have questions as I'm going through my presentation, uh, hopefully everybody's familiar with the chat function on Zoom, I would uh, suggest and recommend you uh, post your questions there, and Suzanne, uh, if you would be so kind as to monitor those questions, then perhaps during my presentation, if there's something that really is, you know, uh, worth interrupting me, that's fine, and we can take questions along the way, and if not, I'll uh, take some questions at the, uh, uh, the end of my remarks today. Uh, so I've been doing genealogy since the early 1980s in any sort of methodical way. And I guess I would say it, it, it really hasn't been until the last couple of years that I've really focused um, any attention on what I call medieval genealogy. And I would hasten to add, thanks to COVID, uh, really this last year, I've been able to really immerse myself uh, in that. And I'm sure some of you have been uh, having free time to, to dig deeper into your own genealogies. But so I've learned a lot in the last uh, year and I, I hope what I share with you today will be uh, helpful uh, to you all. Uh, you will see along the way, I, I have personalized this a little bit uh, using my own examples of how I've kind of attacked uh, my own research and hopefully that will be useful examples of how you, know, you and your, your, in your own research can uh, break through some of those those walls. Uh, just a just a aside. You see this uh, dagger here on my face page. Uh, uh, those of you who have been to Virginia City might know there's actually an amazing store there that sells medieval swords and daggers and all kinds of things. And that's where I acquired this particular piece you see in the picture. So if you're really into medieval medieval stuff, uh, head on up to Virginia City. It's right on the on the main street. Okay, uh, so just a few minutes to define the scope of what I'm gonna talk about and define what I mean by medieval. Uh, historians uh, seem to have all kinds of definitions for what's medieval, what's Renaissance, what's Reformation. I'm gonna give you my best 
uh, definitions here of the of the time period we're really talking about in in, in my remarks today and uh, medieval genealogy I think to to most historians view really starts with the fall of the Roman Empire uh, that was in around 400 A.D. Uh, it lasted eight or nine hundred years I would say nine hundred years till uh, the 13th century uh, we've all heard the term dark ages, middle ages, and so forth. That's what we're talking about here. There's early middle ages, et cetera, et cetera, lots of little nuances on this. But what I'm targeting today is tracing your ancestry back to this 800, 900 year period uh, that will define as medieval. Now to get there, uh, you've got to go through some other eras in time. And you see in the slide here, my uh, Renaissance definition, which uh, uh, I say, again, historians would generally say is the 13th to 16th century, uh, when literature, science, uh, and the arts kind of flourished, and we had the Gutenberg Bible, we had Shakespeare, all of that we would call the Renaissance, and as we try to uh, do our research on our medieval ancestors, we've got to plow through the Renaissance. We also have to plow through the Reformation. And uh, in fact, historians are deeply divided on uh, when did the Reformation start? When did it end? Uh, I've said the 16th to 17th century, generally speaking, and that would encompass uh, the Protestant Reformation, uh, the Dutch Reformation. Um, as some of you who have Dutch heritage know that the Dutch Reformed Church uh, uh, had a major presence in uh, New Netherland when the Dutch uh, settled there. So, and some would say that it's still going on today. Um, I have uh, uh, some friends in the Netherlands who tell me that there's still a very vibrant Calvinist uh, community uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, of course that traces back to uh, the 16 hundreds, uh, 1500s actually with uh, John Calvin. So, uh, and you have to plow through the Reformation as well. Uh, but what's the starting point for, for most people? Uh, it's really the early 1600s here in America. Uh, that's when, of course, we had our earliest settlements in New England. I say Virginia here, and I'll talk about that uh, later. But uh, generally speaking, it, it's that era of the early 1600s. Uh, and focusing in particular on what everybody calls the gateway ancestors. I'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes, but uh, that's where we're kind of starting and we're gonna work backwards on this slide until we hit that medieval uh, time period. A vast time period, of course, a thousand years uh, or more, uh, actually more than a thousand years here. Uh, but as I I've said in my uh, materials, it can be done, it can be done. So to the matter at hand. The, the relevant societies are numerous. Uh, there are two handouts that Suzanne uh, circulated with her email today. Uh, one of them is entitled Medieval Heritage Societies. It's a couple of dozen uh, medieval societies. I don't know if you can see me I'm holding this up. It's a two pager. Uh, it has two dozen societies that I think are of, of significance. Uh, many of them uh, are, uh, I, I think, considered the, the, the major ones in no particular order, the uh, Order of the Crown of Charlemagne, the Order of the Norman Conquest, uh, the Baronial Order of Magna Carta, those are just three. Uh, those are kind of the big ones that, that a lot of people in their genealogical work uh, tend to focus on. But uh, in addition to the two dozen on the handout, I would simply say there are scores, scores of other hereditary societies that are focused upon European, uh, generally speaking, uh, heritage. Uh, I've said here in the slide that there's a uh, there's a uh, a website, Hereditary U U.S. Uh, I don't know who runs it, but it, basically they're a clearinghouse for uh, heritage societies. And if you go to their website, there's something called society lists. It's not limited to European or medieval, it's everything under the sun. And you'll see uh, from the sublime to the ridiculous uh, societies that uh, have been organized, uh, some better than 
and others. And there's a complete list there. And then there's also a society meetings uh, tab there, which if you go to, you'll see that there was to be in April of this year, uh, meetings of many, many, many of these societies in Washington, DC. It's an annual event called Heritage Week. Uh, because of COVID, it's been canceled this year. But you can see from looking at the society meetings list, uh, how many societies are up and running, very vibrant. Uh, they have their annual meetings, uh, generally speaking, at and during Heritage Week. Uh, I've been unable to attend because the first one I was going to go to was this year and it was canceled, I should say 2020. Uh, so I'm not sure when I'll get to it, but it's a, a very august uh, list of societies that, that meets every year, as I say. Uh, I, I want to emphasize, even though I had a dagger and all that kind of stuff, these societies are not just about uh, kings and barons and knights and shining arbor, armor. There are other societies that may be of interest to you. Uh, one of my friends in California, uh, who knows what my lineage uh, is, generally speaking, said, well, you know, you're eligible for the society descendants of Lady Godiva. Uh, and of course, I always thought she was a fictional character. She's not. And, uh, and there is a very vibrant society dedicated to her. There's a society dedicated to women of consequences, which is really, you know, a lot of the queens and duchesses and that sort of thing of, of European history, including the likes of Eleanor of Aquitaine, one of my ancestors. Uh, so there's a lot of diversity of these societies, a lot of ways to uh, become involved, some harder to get into uh, than others. I mentioned here that there's a lot of overlapping members. This is something I've discovered is when I get my membership directories, it's often just a lot of the same people from all over the country. The officers very much, uh, very common, uh, our officers of one society, two societies, five societies. And the registrars, this is important for, for all of you, the registrars meaning the genealogists or historians for, for each of these organizations, uh, they too uh, tend to be registrars across a number of different uh, societies. Uh, there's one fellow in California who's uh, with the Mayflower Society there. I think he's the registrar of a dozen of these uh, societies. And some of them because of that are not just familiar with a lot of the ins and outs of one particular society, they can cross reference and work off of their knowledge of all of these societies to help you. And some of them are very helpful uh, in that regard. The good ones, and I've experienced this, the good ones will say, oh, well, you know, having just admitted me to membership in society number one. Oh, you know, you're eligible for society number two. And before you know it, you've got half a dozen societies that you are eligible for based upon the general expertise of one of these registrars. So they're good people to get to know. Um, and uh, I would say they're friendly. Uh, so don't be intimidated uh, by reaching out to them. But you have to be credible. Um, it's like any society, you know, don't just uh, throw some mud at the wall hoping that it will stick. You should be prepared to have a credible package of, of proofs uh, before you go, before you contact uh, one of the registrars for one of these societies. Okay, uh, why am I not? There we go. Okay, how many generations are we talking about? Uh, Suzanne said in her introduction that I'm a 53rd generation descendant. Well, that's true. Uh, and uh, we, we kind of stumbled over the, the, the pronunciation here, but the Merovingian dynasty began in about 400 AD. And if you look at the, at the photo here of the last page of my submission uh, for membership in that uh, society, you'll see a 53 there. Well, that's that's the 53rd generation for me to get there to Childeric, King of the Franks. Uh, and that's about as far back as, as one can go. After, if you go further back, you've hit Rome and the Roman Empire, and there really isn't something like a genealogical society, and they're not really genealogical records uh, that, uh, that really uh, allow you to go much further back. I think there's some mythology that uh, 
uh, the Merovingians ultimately trace back to Jesus Christ. Um, I'm not going to go that far uh, today, but but uh, there is this myth that kind of floats around uh, about you know how far back you can go once you've hit the Merovingian dynasty. Uh, the, the the way that works, by the way, that is the Merovingians lasted until the 700s, uh, replaced by the Carolingians, which is really Charlemagne. So there was this transition in the dynastic world from the Merovingians to Charlemagne and the Carolingian um, uh, Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and it may sound just crazy that you could trace to Charlemagne, but it's much easier than you may think it is. But as you see here in the slide, you can get, when I talk about medieval, you're probably talking about you know, something like 28 generations uh, at, the, at the earliest to hit pay dirt with uh, some of these societies like the Baronial Order of Magna Carta, which we shorthand as the BOMC. Uh, that's 1215. And of course, that's when Magna Carta was signed by King John. Oh, uh, when I was talking to Suzanne the other day, she insisted that I show you my wall here in my office. So I'm going to take two seconds to do that. And you tell me if you can see what's up on my wall. So we have the 11 and a half inch AR-15. Okay, um, I don't think you can see that. These are not subsonic, these are supersonic, so you're going to hear that crack, and it's going to be very loud. Um, I recommend if you're shooting something short like this, run ear probe, and this is going to be very, very loud. Let's see. Somebody's talking. I don't know what's going on. Oh, hold on one second. I'm trying to locate that person who shut off their mic. Hold on. I'll keep going. Okay. So, yes. uh, I'll give you a close up of some of what's on that wall. You probably couldn't see anything. So these are just artifacts, if you will, of some of the, some of the societies. We were talking about the Merovingians. So the beautiful plaque, if you become a member, beautiful um, medallion. All these societies have their stuff, uh, if you will. And this is, this is that, that's 53 generations. Getting closer to us, here's the crown of Charlemagne. Again, beautiful certificate, beautiful medallion. That's 41 generations, so we're getting closer. Uh, the order of the descendants of the Justiciers. What the heck is that? So that's 28 generations. Well, I'm a, I'm a retired lawyer, so I really appreciate this particular society. These are the people who were the equivalent of the Supreme Court justices. Uh, the people who over hundreds of years uh, administered justice in England, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, uh, what have you. Um, and so that's, uh, that's something to, to uh, get interested in. And, and it's also the case that some of these justiciers, some of these, these lawgivers uh, ended up being uh, royal uh, uh, royal members of, of, of English or other uh, countries. So here in, in this example that I'm showing you, this is mine, uh, Prince Henry became Henry II, King of England. But before that, he was a justice here in, in England. So there's a list uh, on their website of all of the people who served in one capacity or another as a justice here. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, I would not say it's a complete list, uh, but it also, you know, has some indications of uh, their, their time of service and that sort of thing. So that's another uh, possible society for consideration. What I've been doing as I, as I get excited about this is I've also been trying to make it real by studying the life and times of these medieval ancestors, at least of mine. And you see one example here. A few of you who are my friends listening in know that I've gone on this uh, uh, mission to collect coins <laughs> related to my medieval ancestor. This just happens to be a coin of Henry II, uh, who was uh, my ancestor in the order of the descendants of the justice here. So I said, well, heck, I'll get the coin. Uh, but there's all kinds of things that you could read up on. Here's a book that I have here in my office. I'm not sure you can see the title. 
uh, excellent book called The Restless Kings, subtitled Henry II, His Sons and the Wars for the Plantagenet Crown. What a wonderful book. It gives you the entire context, uh, in my case, of Henry II, the Plantagenet kings who reigned for hundreds of years in England. Uh, and it becomes a, it just becomes a, a very satisfying uh, way to uh, pass the time is reading the history of, of your royal ancestors if you're so lucky as to, to, to get into that world. So I think it's exciting. Now, how do you get there? Uh, Gateway Ancestors is always the place to start. Gateway Ancestors meaning who in American, early American history uh, has been found to connect back in time with uh, any kind of royal or noble lineage ancestors. Uh, gateway Ancestors who have already been vetted by some of these societies we've been talking about, or I should say all of them, uh, but in many cases, the societies will publish their list of gateway ancestors. So in the example you see here, this is the Baronial Order of Magna Carta's list of gateway ancestors. Of course, I don't have the list here on this one slide, but you can see it starts that very lower line with uh, Ann Abbott, you know, an American from New Jersey at the you know early 1600s, who has been documented to the satisfaction of the Bar Baronial Order of Magna Carta to trace to a baron. And I'll talk about the barons in a little bit. You'll also see on here the the logo uh, for. Uh, for the Crusaders, the military order of the Crusades. These two societies basically are joined at the hips in no small part because if you have a baronial ancestor, uh, 99 times out of 100, you also have an ancestor who was a Crusader. And so in my own case, it was extremely easy once I was able to join the baronial order of Magna Carta to become a member uh, of, uh, of uh, the uh, military order of the Crusades. Uh, these lists of gateway ancestors are not necessarily exclusive. In other words, you might be able to persuade the society to consider some additional American ancestor to be a gateway ancestor. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to do that because these societies tend to think they've got it nailed and they know who is a gateway ancestor in early American history, uh, period, full stop. Uh, and so it may take some doing to introduce a new person to that equation. I have experienced though uh, and, and seen that some of these societies will add new gateway ancestors and they'll say that uh, on their website or what have you. They'll also take some off the list, uh, I should add. Uh, sometimes new information comes along that uh, disqualifies uh, the gateway ancestor, often because everybody thought that, you know, John Smith in Plymouth was the son of Tom Smith in England but it turns out he wasn't. So it breaks the chain and that gateway ancestor is uh, basically disqualified. So uh, in the main, uh, you, you should look at the gateway ancestors as a you know, fairly comprehensive list of who these uh, societies is going to uh, consider uh, in the first instance. Okay, I'm gonna use my own example. Uh, and my admonition is, okay, if you get to the 1700s, let's say you're a member of the Sons of the American Revolution and you've got an ancestor who you've proven at least back to the time of the revolution and you're, you're feeling pretty good about that, but you're interested in exploring uh, further back in time. Well, don't stop because uh, it is uh, often the case and it was my case that I won't call it, you, you'll stumble 
but with a little bit of additional elbow grease, you will find your, your path to one of those gateway ancestors. So two years ago, I had no idea who Thomas Bradbury was. I did have a Revolutionary War ancestor, Thomas Robinson, who I knew about. And he you know, was seven generations removed from me. Uh, not because I thought it was going to take me to you know, European royalty, I just began further researching Thomas Robinson. And you'll see in the slide, well, I, I was able to link him to the Stanion family, which goes further back in you know, early colonial times, generations eight and nine. And then I was able to, and, and I would say stumbled upon, uh, the connection between the Stanion family and Thomas Bradbury, generations 10 and 11. By the way, Thomas Bradbury's wife, Mary Perkins, was a witch. And she was tried and convicted in 1692 as a witch. But he was otherwise a pretty prominent guy. Uh, and so prominent that, you know, here's my bingo moment. I was able to uh, see that Bradbury was a gateway ancestor in multiple societies, seven of them to be, to be precise. And I was kind of off and running with Mr. Bradbury seeking to join these other uh, medieval societies. That's, that's kind of where my journey started. One of the great things about how these societies operate is that once you've been admitted to, let's say, in my case, the Order of the Crown of Charlemagne, uh, other societies will often kind of accept that application, what they call the record copy, as proof of your lineage, at least to somebody in the line that gets you to uh, another ancestor in the other society in question. The example you see here uh, is the uh, order of the House of Wessex. Some of you know that that's the long line of Saxon kings uh, going, going far back, but including the likes of Alfred the Great. And you'll see that this uh, image here is entitled short form application. And in my case, this is all I had to do to join the order of the House of Wessex because I had already been admitted to the order of the crown of Charlemagne. You'll see in the number 10 on this form, it says name of society or the crown of Charlemagne. That simply means, okay, we're, we're gonna rely upon that to establish most, if not all of your lineage to, and you'll look at line eight there, the qualifying king, Cerdic, C-E-R-D-I-C. -E He's about the earliest, I think he is the earliest uh, king in the, in the House of Wessex. Um, and my application, you'll see in line seven, took me as far as Maud of Scotland in this line from me to Cerdic. So I didn't have to prove anything up to Maud of Scotland. Then what? Then you see in section nine, there's that text box. It has the rest of the citations that get me from Maud of Scotland to Cerdic. So this particular organization uh, was very receptive to accepting uh, my application to the Order of Crown of Charlemagne because it's well respected. If I had come forward with some, you know, Joe Doe uh, application, they probably wouldn't have accepted it. So, but the point being, uh, you can leverage off of one application to join a second society if, uh, if, uh, if at all is uh, well documented. Okay, we're getting to the royals now, which is where I kind of get excited about things. Uh, most of you probably know that the royal families, the noble families were constantly marrying each other, not just within a country, but across Europe, uh, English nobles marrying uh, French nobles, et cetera, et cetera. And usually, I call it strategic. Usually these marriages were strategically designed to bring some alliance between countries. Uh, usually they were 
to families of great nobility or even uh, royalty. And you can sort of assume that in those cases, the marriages both veer off into much, much earlier prominent lineages, uh, extending back generations of earldoms and dukedoms and so forth, and possibly even to uh, the likes of Charlemagne. And I'm gonna give you an example uh, in, in a few minutes. And you'll, you'll see here in my comment on the slide, uh, you can go through these strategic marriages and very often find uh, lineages to Alfred the Great, the Kings of Wessex, uh, and other European royal families. Uh, on this uh, uh, Zoom uh, meeting, uh, my friend David Hess and I have been joking over the last uh, few months about our mutual uh, ancestor uh, who have Russian and Scandinavian, Scandinavian uh, ancestral uh, prominence. Uh, my, my baronial ancestor, Hugh Bagod, he was one of the barons of Magna Carta, uh, takes both David and I back to Yaroslav the Wise, uh, who was you know, a fairly prominent guy in Rus, R-U-S, which is now Russia. Uh, and uh, Anna's grandfather, Olaf, Skotkonong was king of Sweden. So it will take you in very you know, unexpected directions once you hit you know, any of these medieval uh, uh, baronial or noble families. I'm gonna use this example. Um, I should have said at the outset, besides just talking to you, I'm gonna try to do a little tutorial here. Uh, Suzanne and I rehearsed this and I hope it works. Uh, but I'm going to use this uh, baronial order of Magna Carta uh, resource to show you how your gateway ancestor uh, could take you in surprising uh, directions. The book in question here is the Magna Carta Sureties 1215, written by Frederick Weiss, who was perhaps, if not the most prominent, then in the top two or three most prominent uh, genealogists and historians uh, focused upon uh, ancient uh, ancestries, uh, medieval ancestries, what have you. This book happens to be focused upon the Magna Carta sureties, who were the 25 barons uh, who are identified in Magna Carta, signed by King John in 1215. Their whole purpose in life as sureties was to ensure the performance of Magna Carta. Well, it all fell apart, as some of you know, because King John decided not to honor uh, Magna Carta. But uh, for better or for worse, uh, these barons were uh, played a central role in Magna Carta. The important part of the book is what you see here in the subtitle. It, it talks about descendants who settled in America during the early colonial years. That's key to what we're talking about is how does this book help guide you uh, to a good place? And I'm gonna talk about it in terms of, my, my metaphor is laddering your way. The book itself, and Suzanne, listen hard. The, <laughs> the version of the book I have was a download from Kindle and it's very interactive and you can manipulate it a lot of different ways. I went online yesterday, and for the life of me, I can no longer find a Kindle version or a downloadable version of the book. Uh, the only way you'll be able to access it today is in a hard copy, either hard copy or paperback version. Um, and I'm hoping Suzanne will add that to the TMCC Genealogy Lab library very soon, because it is really a very authoritative uh, piece of genealogy. And so now uh, I'm going to take a one minute break and I'm going to try to bring that book up. So uh, here's the book and you'll see on the left hand side, can you see my cursor moving? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So this is the, this is what's in the book. And you'll see a section that talks about each of the sureties by name. These are the barons 
who uh, were mentioned, identified in Magna Carta, and it has other sections such as this section here, which is Magna Car Car Carta barons and their wives descended from Charlemagne and Alfred the Great. So from the gateway ancestors, which we'll get to, you know, this section will say, oh, you can trace to these barons who in turn were descendants of Charlemagne and Alfred the Great. Uh, it says wives, I wanna say in, in my experience and in my research, it goes both ways. Both husbands and wives will have these surprising connections in their own right as you're going up your lineage you may encounter a wife who comes from Charlemagne, but you may very well be going up the, the female line and discover that the husband traces to Charlemagne. It's, some of it is uh, piecework. You really have to sweat the details on this, but it is very common, I've discovered, to find one or more people in these lines to the barons who have that kind of a lineage. So let me start with this section here that says, Magna Carta descent of the pioneers. And in the hard copy, all of this will be in there. It just, it just will be in paper form, uh, but for ease of reference, I'm doing it on the Kindle version. So here you have a section here and you'll see the first two people, Appleton and Abel, and it keeps going for many pages. But what this is, is a chart that's, that is a, it, it's entitled lines and these are lines that are uh, documented elsewhere in the book. This is how we're going to get into the laddering concept elsewhere in the book. And in this first example, there's an American gateway ancestor named Appleton, who was from Massachusetts. He connects, I think it's a he, he connects to the lineage that is set forth in line 137. And We'll go through an example of this using my own guy, uh, but that's what these lines mean. Elsewhere in the book, there's a section devoted to the line from which Mr. Appleton descends, okay? And we'll take Mr. Bradbury as my example here. So here he is, it says Bradbury, Massachusetts, 123. So what I wanna be able to do is go look at line 123. So I, I've already pre-greased this. I'm going to go to page 1671. Takes a little bit of it. Almost there. Okay. So here he is. He shows up in line 123. Part 16 of line 123, if I go back a couple of pages, here's 123, line 20, 123. You'll see number one in line 123 is Robert DeVere. Well, he's the Baron. So I know in line 123 that my guy, Thomas Bradbury, number 16 here, you go right up this ancestral line, 16, 15, 14, what have you, and you hit Robert Devere, Baron of Magna Carta, okay? And you'll also see if you go just down one spot there, oh, I'm sorry, wait a second. If I go backwards, you see where it says 120-1 against his name. Every time you see that in parenthetical, it means there's another line, another place to go in this case, line 120. So now I'm gonna to go to a different section. And here I am, Robert Devere, 120-1. And if I go one level down, you'll see by the way that he was a Lord Chamberlain of England. So not just a baron, but all of these barons tended to have some prominent position of authority, chamberlains, sheriffs, what have you. And you'll see that in these blurbs as you're 
uh, going through the book, uh, Frederick Weiss, the author, was good to uh, annotate all of these lines with important information about this particular baron or his descendants. So if I go to Hugh de Vere, his son, you'll see a reference there that he married Hawise Quincy, daughter of Sayre de Quincy. Well, if you look right to the left of me in the table of contents here, you'll see here's Quincy. So I now know that Robert de Vere's son, Hugh, was married to the daughter of another baron. There are so many intersections, intersecting families. Uh, it can make you crazy sometimes, but as you go through these lines, you will trip on many other branches of the tree that take you in different directions. It so happens that Sarah de Quincy was married to someone who was a descendant of Charlemagne. And that's pointed out elsewhere in this book. So that's one example of how I go from one of my gateway ancestors to a baron, in this case, Robert de Vere. Let me take one other example. Uh, back to Magna Carta Descent of the Pioneers. Another guy in my line, uh, hold on. It's not letting me move here. All right, Constance Southworth of Massachusetts. Some of you may know that name. He was a pretty uh, high, uh, important guy in early Plymouth colony. Uh, actually ended up being the ward of uh, William Brewster. Uh, but Constance Southworth shows up here as a gateway ancestor. Uh, to whom? Well, let's take a look. So he's referenced there at line 96. We're going to go, first of all, this is what I mean by the laddering, by the way. You might get, we're going up and up and up through different segments. of lineage. All right. All right, so you'll see here 18. This is in line 96, which is what he was referred to in that table of contents. Uh, here's Captain Thomas Southworth, born in Leiden. And we're going to go up that line back in time. Ensign Constant Southworth. Alice Carpenter was the wife of a Southworth. I think she ended up as the second wife of William Brewster. I can't remember the details. We're going up the line of the Southworth. And we're going to get up to ultimately Maud. Le Zouple, it says, that's misspelled. It's actually Maud Le Zouche. She came from a prominent family. So that's not the end of the line. We're going to go to 90-6 to see what she's all about. So we're going to go back down here. I'm going to take us back. All right, there's Maud. In a different line, this is now line 90. And we're going to go up her line. Her father, Alan, he was a governor and other prestigious things. Uh, his father, Roger, we're going up this line. And guess what? Roger married Ella Longsby, great granddaughter of Henry II. So if I stop there, I'd say, all right, I haven't even gotten to my baron, but I know I can now trace to King Henry II through this line, through Maud Lazouche, who nobody has ever heard of, but this is the voyage of discovery, right? Ella Longsby, uh, her father, William, just as an aside, uh, we might see him elsewhere in here, but 
uh, he was actually an illegitimate son of Henry II. But for purposes of these lineage societies, they accept lineages that run to or through an illegitimate son or daughter, just so you know. And that's how Ella Longsby uh, gets in here as the great granddaughter of King Henry II. But we're gonna keep going. So here we are at the end of line 90, we're back to another De Quincey, Elena De Quincey. And we're still not done. Uh, we're gonna go now see the parenthetical 74-3. So now we're gonna go to that one. We're still climbing the ladder. So we're gonna go to All right, here's Elena de Quincy. Says who she was married to, constable of the Tower of London. She was married to Baron Zouche, constable of the Tower of London. And we're gonna keep going up and we get to the person I was referring to earlier, Sarah de Quincy, married to Margaret de Beaumont, descendant of Charlemagne. So I now know if I go all the way back down the ladder that Constance Southworth in Plymouth traces all the way up to Baron de Quincey and ultimately through his wife, Margaret, to Charlemagne. Are these good examples? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> No, they're great examples. <laughs> it's a little bit funky to do this online, I have, I have to say. If you had the book in your hand, it might be a little bit easier. I'm not sure because I've never had the physical book in hand. Uh, but so you, you kind of have to jump around. And like I say, there are little bits of lineages that you kind of have to add up going up the ladder. You know, I go up this ladder and then I go over to another line. I go up another ladder, I go over to another line, up another ladder. Uh, but ultimately, there's more likely than not, there's pay dirt at the end. And the reason I focused on this book is, is it's, as I've maybe suggested to you, it's not just about barons. It's about kings and queens. It's about Charlemagne. It's about um, Al, uh, uh, Alfred the Great. I think he's referenced in here somewhere. Uh, oh, yes. Go back on this number two, Roger de Quincey. Uh, it references the daughter of Alan of Galloway named in the Magna Carta. So here again, I've got another Baron on my way to Sarah de Quincey. I've stumbled onto Alan of Galloway, also a Baron of Magna Carta. And you go over here to the table of contents and he's there. Uh, where is he? There he is. Galloway. Uh, so that's just a, a lot of these uh, connective tissues among these families uh, bring you to multiple barons, multiple royals, uh, multiple, you know, famous uh, people in history, whether they're kings of Wessex, as in Alfred the Great, Charlemagne, what have you. I think William the Conqueror is in the mixture uh, as well. So uh, that's a tutorial. Let me get out of this and get back to my PowerPoint, I hope. Jonathan, uh, yeah. we've gotten a lot of excitement about this in the chat box. Um, the, people want to know the name of the title of that book one more time. Do you have that on your slide that you can bring back up? Uh, I can surely do that. There it is. Give everybody a moment to write it down. While people are writing it down, I want to mention too the other handout uh, that you have in Suzanne's email from earlier today. Uh, besides the medieval heritage societies list, uh, there is a list of it's, it's a partial reading list, I guess I would call it. And uh, on there, you'll see that the the, the first multiple listings uh, are books by Frederick Weiss. So this book we're staring at is his book about Magna Carta, but his multiple books, uh, if, 
if you cite nothing else in your application than Weiss, most genealogists, most registrars accept that without challenge. And in some of my own applications, as I go up my uh, generations. Jonathan I, Jonathan, I don't mean to interrupt, but we, we're not seeing your screen. We're just seeing oh, you. I'm very sorry. OK, well, let me start over. I, I have it up on mine, but let me close out. Start over. OK, I need to share screen. Perfect. Now we see it. OK. And I'm going to play from current slide. Oop. There we go. OK. Can you see it? Yes, now we can see it. Thank you. All right, good. I was talking about Frederick Weiss. Uh, in my own case, and I think this is just generally true, the, the genealogists, historians, registrars accept his works as authoritative. So what I just went through with you, you can kind of go to the bank with it. Um, I'd be surprised if any genealogist would say, oh, I'm not going to accept Frederick Weiss. He, he really has written the Bible, actually multiple Bibles on these subjects. And if you go to what I uh, attached as the partial reading list, I'll just read you a couple of names of the books. Uh, ancestral Roots of Certain American Colonists Who Came to America Before 1700. Uh, that's actually, Suzanne, in your library. Uh, cross Index of Ancestral Roots of 60 American Colonists. The Lineage of Alfred the Great, Charlemagne, and Some of Their Descendants. Order of Americans of Armorial Ancestries. And then this book, Magna Carta Sureties, 1215. Uh, so if we had all of those books in the library, Suzanne, <laughs> you, you could probably uh, hit pay dirt uh, again if you can find that gateway ancestor. I think that's the key thing for research purposes is once you've gotten that gateway ancestor, uh, to, to use the, the vernacular, you're off to the races. And that was true in my own case. Uh, so, uh, and, and you don't have to work very hard at that point because it's all pretty much documented in these texts, uh, such as the one we're looking at, and uh, and generally accepted. The other, well, let me just keep going here. These are takeaways. Uh, the key key uh, authors besides Weiss, Douglas Richardson. He's on the partial reading list, so you'll see some of his books cited, the main one uh, that would be of interest to all of you is Royal Ancestry, a study in colonial and medieval families. He also has done a book on Magna Carta and also Plantagenet Ancestry, a study in medieval and colonial families. I'm kind of a nut about the Plantagenets as my friends on this uh, Zoom meeting may know. Uh, but uh, so Richardson has a whole book devoted to the Plantagenets, tracing yourself to one or more of the Plantagenet kings. And frankly, if you hit one of the kings, you hit them all. Uh, if, you, <laughs> if you hit uh, Edward III, then you're gonna go all the way back to Henry II uh, and then to William the Conqueror. So those are important books from, from Richardson. And then the last person I mentioned here is Gary Roberts. Uh, he's his most, the book that he wrote, which is of more recent vintage, The Royal Descendants of 900 Immigrants to the American Colonies, is a very important book. Um, it's available. I forget how much it costs, but it's a very important uh, compendium, uh, again, with lots and lots of names of 900 immigrants who have royal connections. So that's one you may want to track down. I, I don't think, Suzanne, you have it in your library, but hopefully you will someday. Uh, great book, important book. And if you get through all of that, you get to the barons you know, it, it, as, the, as the sequence of, of historical uh, research goes, you go from the barons to Charlemagne, and then ultimately, you know, this is my favorite, the kings of the Merovingian dynasty. <laughs> Uh, so what are the takeaways? I would say, you know, number one on the list by, by a mile, 
familiarize yourself with all the available lists of gateway ancestors that most of these societies have. Uh, they should be readily accessible uh, on their websites. And on the Medieval Heritage Society's handout that uh, Suzanne circulated, I put asterisks against the names of the societies that have published lists of gateway ancestors. I may have missed one or two, but uh, I went through yesterday to you know, confirm, for example, that the Order of the Crown Charlemagne has its own list of gateway uh, ancestors, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have one of those, or you think you have one of those, the second takeaway, I, I think, and this has been my own experience, is if you haven't yet gotten yourself to about generation 10, 11 in your research, it's often the case that there will be family or town histories that will document the families in that town, for example. And in many, many cases, you know, your family will be in there. Um, I just did this with one of my uh, friends where we were both seeking to join uh, the first families of New Hampshire. Uh, and our ancestors both came from the town of Hampton. There's a book entitled History of the Town of Hampton. And in there is a very uh, detailed accounting of our uh, families, you know, father, son, grandson, et cetera, et cetera and fully documented. So look for those town histories if you're in those generations. This is true for any genealogy you're doing, uh, having you know, not, not even anything to do with going back to medieval times. These are great resources for any of your research on your American ancestors. Look for books or other historical writings that have at least some footnoted source materials because many of these societies, again, not limited to medieval, genealogical societies won't accept family histories, town histories, what have you, that don't have some sort of uh, sourced materials in the footnotes or, or what have you. I've encountered this, for example, working for a friend on her Jamestown Society application. You know, there's some books out there that Jamestown just rejects. They won't even consider them because it's just somebody writing without any citations to any evidence. So you really wanna try to cite you know, valid sources. I put in parenthetical here that, you know I've encountered this, probably you have. Ancestry will often have these family collection citations in the hints. Uh, you click on the hint and you'll see three or four or five family collections. Those don't count for anything. On family search, it's the same thing. I've encountered that people just put stuff on, on, on the trees on family search, which is, I can tell, just wrong um, and not really sourced to any documents or, or what have you. So I would say stay away from those kinds of citations if you're putting your package together. Um, and then as we've just encountered, as we looked at, at the Weiss book, once you trace to Europe in your lineage, start looking for those family ties between spouses, you know, the, you know, who's marrying whom, what line, what branch goes out from the wife, what branch goes out from the, it, it's a constant exploration. And I, you know, my tree now is about 3000 people because I keep, you know, going down these different paths, going down these different branches. And again, sometimes you, uh, you discover just wonderful things. So I will conclude my remarks by saying it can be done it is easier than you think going back 53 generations. Uh, and I would for one be happy to assist anybody within reason uh, in looking at uh, your uh, line and seeing if we can find that uh, connection to medieval uh, families and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but of course, Suzanne, you provide free genealogical services and I would certainly uh, defer to Suzanne in the first instance to get more help on uh, on this front. So uh, uh, Suzanne, do we have questions in the chat? Yes, we do. Uh, let me give you the first one. The first one is from David and he would like to know what happens to your membership status if your qualifying ancestry becomes unqualified after you join? 
well, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I have a friend uh, in the California Mayflower Society who is a member of the Order of Alba, which sounds obscure, but Alba is the original name for Scotland, basically. And the Order of Alba is basically anybody who can trace to a Scottish king. Um, in my case, I got lucky and I uh, found a, a lineage to Malcolm III, uh, one of the kings of Scotland, and then from him, you just go back in time. But my friend was relying upon a gateway ancestor and the New England Historical Gene Genealogy Society, one of their genealogists wrote a paper that debunked that gateway ancestor's heritage. And that was the end of him. So, <laughs> It, it, yeah, it, I, don't, I think I answered your question, David. It, 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 you may get uh, rethought if your gateway ancestor is uh, rejected. Thank you. Um, Tracy wanted to know, uh, wanted you to know that Bradbury is her direct ancestor as well. Yay! Hey, Tracy. <laughs> Cousin. Uh, let's see here. Well, wait, a uh, wait, wait a second. So, Tracy, do you do you belong to any of these other medieval societies? Tracy, you can go ahead and unmute your microphone. No, I had no idea until today. I was all excited about him because his wife was a Salem witch. That was my big, big thing. I didn't know that he was anything special at all. I thought it was all about her. Yeah, so, well, no. like, I, like I said in my remarks, you are a descendant of at least seven different royal or noble uh, heritages. So I'm happy to work with you, Tracy, cousin. Uh, uh, I, I would love that. I need a tiara or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I hate to say it, some of those uh, royals and so forth were beheaded. So be careful. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, Mary Perkins, uh, Bradbury's wife, mm -hmm. she is the only witch. She wasn't a witch, uh, but she was convicted of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. She's the only witch who wasn't executed. I, I know that. I know. I, I've mm -hmm. done a lot of reading about her. Right. I'm so excited. Great. Suzanne, more questions? Okay, let me continue going down here. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here, I'm reading them now. Oh, um, Monette would like to know, does the order of the um, Merovingian uh, dynasty still require sponsors to join? Uh, no. What, what, here's what I did. Let me just give you my example. So I was already a member of the Order of the Crown of Charlemagne. The registrar, Tracy Crocker, for that, org for that society uh, said, well, you're eligible for the Merovingian Society. I said, what's Merovingian? <laughs> and I went and read up on it and I said, okay, I wanna join. And he, he on his own steam within 48 hours prepared my application and submitted it because it was so well known, well documented, well understood by trained genealogists that there, there's no need for further documentation. There's no need to prove anything. Uh, if you have a line to Charlemagne, you don't have to really prove anything to go back to uh, Clovis and, and those early Merovingian kings. So that's why I say it can be done and it's easier than you think. Okay, we have another question. Uh, let's see here. Connie would like to know if uh, Fitz refers to being illegitimate. Uh, I don't think so. There are lots of Fitzes uh, in English history. I have many of them and I certainly don't believe that they are all illegitimate. I believe Fitz just refers to son of. Say again? I believe the term Fitz means son. That's exactly correct. 
Now there may be fitzes that are illegitimate, but I don't think that's the, <laughs> that's the Why reason. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> Okay, let me continue scrolling down here. Uh, Wendy wanted to, everyone to know that she's a Southworth heir from William Bradford. There you go. I said Brewster. I said Brewster. I, I was mistaken. It, it, you're right. It was Bradford. It's Bradford. Yes, yes. So now once I get from the Mayflower, the Mayflower Society, my official line, I'm really excited. My daughter's excited. She goes, now, can we be related to Queens and Queens? Do we, can we get a piece of the house in England? <laughs> you know, I've always thought that somewhere in the last thousand years, somebody screwed up the deeds to some of these baronial estates and that I'm owed some land somewhere. Me too. <laughs> well, I'm excited for you because Constance Southworth will take you to Kings and Queens. I'm excited. And I, that DeVere name too that you pulled up or Vere, I have that also on um, my, my paternal, the Goddard name goes back to that too. So I've seen that. So just too much. It's so much information. Yeah. But it was great. Thank you. And I'm trying to remember one of our participants today is a De Beaumont. Is that right, Mike? Mike Fitzpatrick, were you, were you a were you a Beaumont? Uh, no, it, it, it was a uh, uh, Beecham, pronounced English Beecham, but French Beauchamp. Okay, I was close. Yeah, I'm a I'm a Beaumont. Is that Roger? Roger? Yes. Well, there you go. And uh, I was trying to send this. Uh, Bradford doesn't uh, relate to Southworth except through. Uh, Alice Carpenter. There, there's no direct line to Southworth through Bradford. I think he was, like I said, I thought he was a ward of Bradford. He lived with the Bradfords. Not by blood. Right. He was a hanger on with Bradford. And Jonathan, uh, one of the students looked up the, the Weiss book that you've been sharing, and she said that the most current one is the fifth edition with additions and corrections. Yeah, I think it maybe cost 50 bucks on Amazon, something like that. But Suzanne, you're going to buy it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe I'll buy more than one copy. <laughs> <laughs> you might need it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just thinking. If you could see the private messages that I've been getting through this presentation, you wouldn't believe it. People are really excited about this. Uh, let's see here. Let me continue scrolling down through the questions. Let's see here. Okay, uh, Adrian says, uh, and this is more of, I think, of a more general question, Jonathan. She says, I am first generation American. Uh, what should I be looking for to, co to connect to a baron, et cetera? Well, uh, multiple answers to that. First, where did she come from? Second, what do you know about your heritage from wherever you came from? Uh, third, is there some resource out there, book or otherwise, that comes close to uh, you know, your, your line in whatever country you're coming from. That's about as far we, as I'm We concerned. are from England. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay. We are from England. Um, and I saw my father's last name in that book, Barham, B-A-R-H-A-M. So I would like to connect to that. Well, it may be that, for example, some of the books I have cited to you, I don't have them here in my library, but for example, uh, Gary Boyd Roberts' book, The Royal Descendants of 900 Immigrants, it probably doesn't cover you because the 900 right. immigrants were a long time ago. No, uh, I've gone back to the, to the, the early 1600s on the Barham line. In America? No, I'm first generation American. My parents yeah. are from England. Everything I'm doing is in England. 
Okay. Well, we could go offline and talk about, you know, research tools, because I've done some of that using, you know, English records, parish okay. records. Uh, okay. It can get quite dense and difficult. Some of these records yes. only exist in, if you know what a parish chest is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You have to go literally to the parish. They've got a literal chest. You got to open the chest. You got to look what's in the chest. My not... uncle has done a great number of those. So really? <laughs> that's, that's how I'm able to do a lot of this. Yes, that's how we've gotten back so far. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Yes, I'd love to talk to you after. Thank you. Sure. I think, Suzanne, uh, I'll send you my email. And when you send out the, hopefully you'll send out a copy of this slide deck uh, with my email address if people want to contact me. Yes, I can do that with no problem. However, I just want to caution the audience that if your email um, doesn't take, uh, sometimes when I send out PowerPoint presentations, the size of the file is so large that you know some people's email kicks it back. Uh, but if that's the case, just let me know and maybe I can do it in a Dropbox or share it on my Google Drive or something like that. Are we still recording? Yes, we're still recording. Right, so I'm not going to give you my email over the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll put it, we'll put it in your, uh, when I send it out to the students, as soon as our marketing department is done editing the video, uh, we'll put it in that email to the students. Okay. Okay. Um, you know what, Connie says she's already ordered the book during the presentation. She went on to Amazon and ordered it. So it looks like people are really, really, really uh, uh, getting into this whole concept of, of gateway ancestors. Uh, Richard says that his ancestor is Constance Southworth, first cousin 12 times removed. Well, we talked about Constant. We got another cousin who was just talking about Constant. Uh, and uh, Sarah, don't worry if you lost the chat box. Don't worry about it. I have everything. So don't, don't give it any second thought. Just contact me after class is over today. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Richard says, uh, Thomas Yale, a gateway ancestor, 12th generation grandfather or 12th great grandfather. So that's another exciting find for Richard. Wonderful. And if uh, any of you who know Richard, who uh, Richard is a normal um, uh, regular in our class, and uh, he has a fascinating family tree. I could sit and talk to Richard for hours about his family tree. It's fascinating. Uh, Sarah says, great presentation. Uh, oh, Connie says the book was, she got the book for $35. There uh, you go. Wonderful. That's very, very reasonable. Uh, let's see here. I'm continuing to read through the questions. Um, Nettie says she really appreciates today's lecture because uh, she ran across heritage that suggested a link to Charlemagne and she had no clue on how to follow up, but now she does. So thanks for the lead, she says. Hey, I should mention, by the way, Suzanne, uh, on the Gateway Ancestors for the Baronial Order of Magna Carta, I should say in the book by Weiss, that section where he lists uh, American descendants is much shorter than the list of gateway ancestors on the Baronial Order of Magna Carta website. In other words, there's more gateway ancestors than what you find in the book. So don't just look at the book, look at the BOMC website listing. Wonderful. Uh, and then Connie wanted everyone to know that the Order of Alba has a Facebook page that is wonderful. So for those of you who have Facebook accounts, that might be something that you might want to look into. And by the way, Jonathan, are there any Facebook groups that, that you could recommend, uh, you know, it, in light of today's presentation? Well, don't, don't quote me. I loathe Facebook. And so I don't participate. <laughs> I couldn't tell you, in other words. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Now, I know you showed earlier all the wonderful certificates, uh, the Lineage Society certificates that you have on your wall. How long, just as, as I'm sure people, when they saw all those wonderful certificates, uh, how, about how long have you been doing your family history? Are we talking five years, 10 years, 20 years? What are we talking? Oh, the first concerted effort I made was a trip to England in 1982 to do family research. Uh, but my childhood was basically my father driving us around to old graveyards and that sort of thing. So I guess I should say my, all my life. A real testament to like getting those younger generations involved. I mean, look at that. I mean, it, it sparked a lifelong interest in your family history in you. That's beautiful. 
Well, what really sparked, I'm just telling tales now and I, I don't want to bore everybody. On that trip to England, I went there because I was going to look up, I, my middle name is Cobb, I was going to look up the Cobbs in Northern England. I quickly concluded that they were descended from Vikings because that particular area in Nottinghamshire had been invaded and settled by Vikings and the name Cobb is a derivation of a Scandinavian name, blah, 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 blah. And so that's what really got me, piqued my interest is, okay, what about these Vikings? And there's no Viking records, so I got very frustrated. Now there's so much available. You know, what I was doing in 1982, you know, was all hand labor. Uh, that's all you could do then. Much easier today. Oh, uh, Tracy just posted in the chat box that a version of the book that you've been talking about is on Ancestry.com. So if you have an Ancestry.com account, uh, go into the book catalog and uh, run the uh, the author's name or the title of the book through the, the book the catalog. The problem with that, the problem with that, Suzanne, I've done that, uh, okay. is name search. Okay, let's use Constance Southworth as an example. You put Constance Southworth's name in there and it's just going to show you one line in the book. That's it. It's it's not interactive. It's not really going to be very helpful. I see. Good advice. You know, very often I have seen trees on Ancestry.com, you know, public trees on Ancestry.com and Family Search that go back the medieval times. And, I, and I've often wondered where in the world they got that information. So today's presentation has certainly been a great education to me. Now I've got, you know, a way of, of uh, looking at those trees a second time and, and knowing how to cross check if I want to you know, take any of that information and put it into my tree. So um, thank you. I mean, I learned a tremendous amount today. Uh, let's see I'll, here. I'll, oh. leave with, I'll leave with one tantalizing clue for some of you who think you're now going to go do this research. One of the great uh, non-king people in these lines, I'm going to hold up another book. Uh, move it up a little bit further. No, uh, uh, no up. Yeah, a little higher. Yeah, right there. Okay. Okay. Perfect. This is about William Marshall. It's entitled A Great, Int I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, sorry. I'm dawdling here. Well, I'll just uh, say the name of the book is The Greatest Knight, William Marshall, who shows up in a lot of these lines or his daughter does or what have you was the greatest knight in English history. He was an advisor to six of the Plantagenet kings. Imagine that from a young age to an old age. He was a constant presence in the royal life of England for you know, almost 150 years, something like that. So if you see any references to Marshall, jump on it because he's a very important and colorful figure in English history. Okay, uh, Sarah wants to know, do you know why they changed uh, Alba to Scotland? Why did they change the name? Well, uh, there was actually another name, which was, uh, so my ancestor, Malcolm, uh, ultimately traces back to uh, Kenneth McAlpin, who was, who was considered to be the first king of Scotland. He was actually king of the Picts, P-I-C-T-S, which derived from, you know, ancient Celtic um, peoples. Uh, Alba, you know, I just don't know the answer to that, but, but uh, it, it has something to do with the Picts. And when Scotland became Scotland after uh, Kenneth McAlpin, um, they basically did no longer re refer to it as Alba. Wonderful, okay. Uh, let's see here. You know what? I got to tell you, Jonathan, you just gave me like a ton of new ideas for ebooks of the week. <laughs> this presentation has opened up a whole new, you know, uh, facet that I, I can exploit in our ebook collection uh, for months to come. So <laughs> well, this is why my, one of my slides says don't stop. <laughs> and I say that uh, because I didn't stop. And I realize now that once you have that one bingo moment, you know, you can spend years now enjoying all of this ancient 
genealogical research. It's really fun. And I really encourage people to not stop. It's great to join the Mayflower Society, but don't stop, you know? Yeah, Alba is actually Gaelic for Scotland. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, I, we have such wonderful uh, people in the class. I mean, they just, we have such, you know, wonderful people who are so advanced in genealogy and researchability. So thank you for that. Okay, so I'll give everyone just a few more moments here to put in it, either un unmute your microphone and ask a question or put it into the chat box, whichever you prefer. And uh, I'll give that a few more moments before I stop the recording and thank our, our guest speaker. Jonathan, what was the name of that legal society from England that you talked about again? The Order of the Des Descendants of the Justiciers. Thank you. Okay, so we're getting a lot of people saying thank you in the chat box. Wonderful presentation, great presentation. So with that, uh, let's see here. I think that was all the questions I had. Um, let me just look over my list here. Oh, I wanted to let the class know, we do have several volumes of the Descendants of Charlemagne in our genealogy book collection, but of course our library is still you know, uh, closed to the public due to the COVID-19 virus. Um, but I am going to be on campus next week, so maybe I'll check those Descendants of Charlemagne books out and bring them home, and I will happily offer to do lookups for anybody. So um, just uh, shoot me an email, and I'll bring those books home. I'm going to be on campus next Tuesday. So with that, okay, I'm going to say uh, thank you very, very much, Jonathan. Again, you've been so generous to our class in, in not only speaking, but in donations as well. And we'll be talking about that again shortly. So with that, I'll say thank you, unless anyone else has a last minute question. No? Okay, all right. Well, Jonathan, I'm gonna say thank you very much and I'm gonna stop the recording right now